Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is part of pop music history. From 1970 to 75, he was part of one of the greatest male vocal groups of all time, the Drifters, who brought us so many hits, including Money Honey. I went to the window and peeped through the blind and asked him to tell me what was on his mind. There Goes My Baby. There goes my baby Moving on down the line Wonder where, wonder where Wonder where she is bound This Magic Moment. This Magic Moment So different and so new But like any other until I kissed you. Save the last dance for me. You can smile if you smile for the man who held your hand neath the pale moonlight. But don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So, darling, save the last dance for me. Up on the roof. When this For me to fail on Broadway. They say the neon lights are bright on Broadway. On Broadway. They say there's always magic in the air. On Broadway. And under the boardwalk. When the sun beats down and burns the tar up on the roof And your shoes get so hot you wish your tired feet were fireproof Under the boat, down by the street, yeah. Since their creation in 1953, the Drifters have sold a staggering 240 million singles and 140 million albums. During our guest's time with the Drifters, they recorded three albums containing the hit songs Down on the Beach Tonight, Kissing in the back row of the movies. Your mama says that through the week you can't go out with me. But when the weekend comes around, she knows where we will be. Kissing in the back row of the movies on a Saturday night with you. Love games. And there goes my first love. There goes my first love. With the guy used to call my friend. There goes love I thought would never end. And I can't forget her. Which topped the British and European charts in the early 70s. In 1975, our guest left the group to pursue a solo career and formed his own record and production company, Superbad Records, with DJ star Freddie Mac in the UK. He recorded two hit songs for that label, You're Like Magic and Let's Take a Chance, followed by Give to the Ones We Love, which he wrote and recorded as a fundraiser for the British Heart Transplant Trust. He's performed in nightclubs and concert halls all over the world as a solo artist and as part of the Drifters Legends and he's the CEO of the Drifters Legends Clubhouse, which has published three of his books about the Drifters Legends. He's also a photographer, a video and graphic design artist, and he hosts his own podcast 
on the Clubhouse radio platform. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Butch Leak to our show. Butch, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Javi. <laughs> Butch, when I was doing my research for this interview, I was amazed to learn that you studied aeronautical engineering. So when did you decide to pursue a music career? Oh, it was just something that kind of came out of nowhere, so to speak, because uh, I, you know, I decided at the last moment to go into to go to Vietnam. That's what it was. I actually cut schooling <laughs> and and I wanted to get out of the, the you know, the neighborhood because it, it was a tough time during that during that period, uh, especially with the drug issues and all the things that were happening uh, uh, during that era. And so I was kind of a timid child. So, you know, I, I decided, let, let me get out of the neighborhood. I volunteered to go into the military. As a matter of fact, I didn't even tell my my, my family, you know, my mom. And uh, when I came home that evening, you know, she, she got on me and said, why are you so late? You know, getting in. I said, oh, I decided to go into the military. She said, what? <laughs> You know, she went kind of crazy there. And when are you going? Tomorrow. <laughs> it was the next day, you know. So, okay. <laughs> and so there I was off to, to follow my desire, you know, to get out of the you know, neighborhood and go see the rest of the world. But then you I mean, were recruited by Bill Fredericks to join the Drifters, correct? Yeah, that was after I well, after I left Vietnam and came back to New York. And of course, I was you know, looking for a job. There wasn't a lot going around at that time. And so I was happened to be singing, oh, well, sitting, excuse me, in a, a night spot in up in Harlem called Allen's Alley. So we were just singing, we were drinking, you know, is what you do on the weekends and so on and so forth. And so this guy came down. Oh, and he yelled out and said, hey, this guy down here, he can hit a note. You know, said, who is he? <laughs> but Bill Fredericks was somebody that I, I knew partially from the neighborhood because we all, you know, grew up in around the same area. So I, I saw him, used to see him before. And he, and he asked me, he said, what you doing? I said, well, looking for a job. He said, oh, looking for a job. He says, well, would you be interested in singing? I said. Singing? I said, singing what? Singing with who? He said, the drifters. I said, the drifters? Yeah. <laughs> well, you grew up listening to and loving the drifters, and then you got to be a part of the group. That must have felt surreal for you to become one of the drifters. Oh, yes, it was. I mean, you know, in my very young years and going to the Apollo Theater and stuff like that, I was looking at groups like the Drifters, including the Drifters, but never knew that one day that I would be part of that that outfit. And so as, you know, luck or fate <laughs> shines, uh, I was dra I was drafted in into the group. And, and the rest for, is history. Yeah, basically, it, it, you know, it, it, it's all history. I, I, I didn't think at first that I would be accepted because the first job at that time, they, was, they were working up in Boston. So I went to Boston and I really didn't know a lot of what I was doing, you know. So I even got those pictures today. We, we were standing, we used to work with two mics and the guys in the background would be around one mic. So I'm in the back and the two guys were squeezing me out, sort of like, because I was really miming what I was doing. <laughs> Well, you know, I was going to ask you that. It, it, was it difficult to join a group that was already so well established? No, not really. You know, the Drifters is a, it's a very interesting story. And I tell people this all the time. It was a very loose outfit. And what I mean is we hardly did any rehearsals or anything of that nature. You did everything on stage. That's where it's from. You know, that was the proving ground, even a new song. We launched it on stage. We hardly ever rehearsed it. But for some reason, that style managed to get over. I mean, we actually became the 
the masters of impromptu, you know, you know, well, that's I, so interesting because when I look <laughs> at the videos of your performances back then, Butch, especially your dancing, the drifters were not like the temptations or the four tops or Gladys Knight in the pit. Your dancing was much more relaxed and improvised. Don't you think? Yeah, that's the way it was. I mean, I used to follow groups. I mean, I, you know, like Temptations, Gladys Knight and the Pips were all my favorite groups. I knew them very well. And being a dancer myself, I always wanted that smooth choreography and stuff like that. But you can never get it out of these guys. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't going down that road. So what basically why not? Happened, what, what, why didn't they like the more polished choreography of the other groups? It was just... It was just something they they didn't do. You know, they, they kept it very simple. It was just a style of the group. I mean, mind you, in the earlier days, they they did a little bit more dancing. But as the years went on, they sort of left the dancing to one individual. Like, for instance, the guy I replaced was a guy uh, called Rick Shepard. He was doing most of the dancing for the group during that period and i came in because i was you know more of a dancer i took over that aspect so you know i, I had this great little three four five minute number at the end tagging the show and that was like a big highlight you know <laughs> but, but everything else we did was very simple just very basic <laughs> now during your time with the drifters the group re-recorded their classic song, Save the Last Dance for Me. Why did they decide to do that? Well, that was Roger Greenway. Roger uh, Greenway, as you know, did the hit track to teach the world how to sing the Coca-Cola jingle. I mean, Roger, Roger Greenway was a staunch Drifter fan. He loved the Drifters so much. So it was like a, a marriage made in heaven for the third Golden Age group. And he sort of emulated everything that came out of the second golden age, you know, during the Benny King and the Rudy Lewis period. And so he decided to put uh, Save the Last Dance for Me. He wanted us to do Save the Last Dance for Me, which was on our first album, uh, The Drifters Now, after we uh, signed with Bell Records in, uh, in the UK. And that particular album wasn't a big album, but it had some of the best songs that we ever did was right on on that album and and our version of save the last dance for me is very compatible to the first one I mean, you know, it is just as good or better. I mean, to be honest. <laughs> oh, I know? agree. I agree. Now, <laughs> yeah. um, you recorded an album called Love Games. And the That's title correct. song from that album, Love Games, is my all-time favorite song from your time with the Drifters. I've never understood why that song didn't become a big hit. Butch, were you surprised it didn't go to number one? Yes. The problem was... They didn't get it out on time for Valentine's Day. That was the that was basically the target, <laughs> you see. But it didn't it didn't come out. It should have been. It went to number thirty three. But it it everybody loves that song. Even to the day, they always ask, "Sing that song." You know, if I do anything solo, sing "Love Games." But "Love Games" was. It was my favorite song, actually. You know, I love, I love, we had a lot of great songs, but that one, I just, I just liked it. And all the, the younger generation, they love that song, even to today, you know, they always ask for that song. It should have been a big, big hit, but as music goes, you know, <laughs> you never can tell. <laughs> I know it's so disappointing, but if anyone watching has not heard Love Games, you've got to hear it. It is, 
it stands up as one of the great, great songs performed by any male vocal group. And I think it's the best Drifters song from the 70s era. Now, in 1975, Butch, you left the group to pursue a solo career. Was that a difficult decision for you? Kind of. I mean, I love the group. I owe a lot to the guys. And but we, you know, we 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 had a lot of internal problems as as it goes in groups and things of that nature. And so it had reached a point that, you know, I decided, you know, I made the decision to leave. Though at that time, I also I, I, I married, you know, I had gotten married and, you know, in the UK. So, you know, I, I had a lot of other little things that I was I was looking at. But our lineup began to sort of peel off around the end of 1974. And you've never regretted leaving the group? No, not really. Not really. And, and I, be, I even returned on a couple of occasions because they, you know, they needed people to fill in. And of course, you know, uh, promoters were having problems because everybody was asking for original members that sang the songs. And Johnny was still there, but everybody else had kind of moved on. Well, so when they, you decided to leave the group, did you ever consider approaching Barry Gordy at Motown? Not really. Not really. Again, I, I knew so many people you know, out of Motown, that period. Like my, my dear friend, God bless his soul, Edwin Starr. He was one of my, he was one of my best friends and we used to work together. I performed on his shows and we also uh, backed him. I had another group that I also used to work with called the Realistics. And we used to back Edwin, you know, we'd go out uh, we do our show, then we turn around and we back him. And then me and Edwin would, you know, I used to do all his sessions and we would work on new songs and things of that nature. He was a very prolific uh, songwriter, but we were we were so really good friends. And so we, we you know, we worked a lot together. But I knew I knew most of the people out of a Motown, a lot of the singers. Matter of fact, even the first time I, I even got up on a stage when I was I was young. Smokey Robinson pulled me up on the stage. <laughs> and I was sitting in the front row at the Apollo Theater. Now, I was shy and everything, but that was kind of a dream come true, you know, because I, I love Smokey Robinson. Ooh, baby, baby, and all that good stuff, you know. <laughs> Who doesn't love Smokey? Now, yeah. Butch, you were the first singer to perform in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia during the reign of the late King Khalid. Tell me about That's that experience. Correct. Oh, that was a very interesting period. We actually, we went out to do this show. Well, I went out to do this show working with a promoter from England and another guy from Hong Kong. There's an interesting background to this story. The guy from Hong Kong was, he was a member of the, the triads, but he had got together with this promoter in England to put on this show. So I was the only singer and we had loads of acts, you know, fire eaters and <laughs> jugglers and all kinds of things. So we went out and they loved me so much. And, and another good thing was that, you see, my, my background back then, I was involved in Islam for, for a period of time. And so when they found out that, of course, they loved me, you know, <laughs> you know, obviously. <laughs> and so they, after the show, they invited me back. They wanted me to come back. But during that period, what happened was these guys got into this, some real skullduggery there. You know, they, they were caught stealing. Yeah. And they threw them out of the country. They took my passport and kept me there. And then they turned around to me and they said, we love what you did, but we want you to bring the shows in. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. And so did you do it? 
we were attempting to, uh, to do it, but it, it we had some problems later on because that was around the time when remember the Iranians took over the American uh, embassy. Yes. And so the whole of the Middle East shut down. So it was kind of a risky kind of business. I think uh, that was and, a sign, Butch. Yeah, that was a sign. You know, it was, I mean, it, it was interesting because my wife, you know, she, I said, do you want to come to Saudi Arabia? I says, you know, she said, come to Saudi Arabia. Are you crazy? The Sheikh sponsor there, he offered her an open check. <laughs> he said, because he wanted me to stay. He said, open check, whatever you want. You come and work for us. <laughs> And but the answer still, was no, right? <laughs> answer was no. So that kind of kill, killed all that. But, you know, I, I, I did still do a lot in Saudi Arabia because uh, my father-in-law was in the commodities business. And so I also used to work with him in commodities. And so I was always wheeling and dealing in and out of uh, Saudi Arabia after that in any respect. So. I had a long relationship with the Saudis for quite a while, and uh, it was a good experience. <laughs> now, in the late 70s, you wrote and performed a song entitled Give to the Ones We Love to support the pioneering work of Dr. Christian Barnard, who was doing the very first heart transplants. All of the money from that song went to the British Heart Transplant Trust. That was such a generous thing for you to do, Butch. I, I want to commend you and applaud you for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that song actually was an interesting song. Uh, basically, uh, I was with EMI at that time. We were talking with EMI. And the song that I brought to them was originally was Anyone Who Had a Heart. That was sung by Dionne Warwick. But EMI, they said, no, nah, we don't think so. It was uh, it's, it's a great song, great hit, but can you come up with something different? So I went back in the studio and me and my arranger, we sat down and then I came up with this song, Give to the Ones We Love. You know, it was, was a song like very poppy kind of song. You know, it went something like, we must give our love to the ones who need. We've got to show them we care. We got to love them, thrill them. Yeah, yeah, we got to spend our time so that they believe that there's more to life, paradise being happy. There's a time in our lives we've got to give little thoughts. Da -da -da. We've got to give our little hearts. <laughs> that was a... Uh, now, I didn't know I was going to get a live performance, Bush. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. And, and well, you raised so, a lot of money for a very important cause, Butch. You really did. Yeah. Well, I don't know how much they, we did, but, you know, it, it, it was there. And, but you very, know, very good karma. Yeah, actually. After I did that song, it actually got me in line for possibly for the Eurovision contest in Europe, <laughs> you see, and, and a lot of other little things that was, uh, you know, going on, you know, during that period. So that was a great thing. Everybody wins when you do something like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, basically, uh, that's what it is. You know, everybody Benefit. wins. Now, Benefits, in, yeah. in 2009, you performed with the Drifters Legends at a big stadium concert in London, where you were presented with the Sony Music Lifetime Achievement Award. That must have been such a special moment for you. Congratulations, Butch. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was a, a nice gesture by uh, Sony. It was given to us by Roger Greenway. That was a moment. Oh, it was a, it was, it, it, it was a moment. Well, you know, the thing is, is that the Drifters being a great, organization but had a lot of downsides and and much of what i've done was always trying to give back you see well i'm i'm glad to hear you say that because i i want to tell you something i did my research for this interview the history of the drifters has been rather dramatic with a lot of ups and downs especially the struggle for control over the name and in my opinion for whatever it's worth butch 
there's been some serious exploitation of some of the members of the group by the ownership and management. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. And you are the one person, sir, who's worked the hardest to sustain and preserve the honor and the legacy, the integrity of the group. And I don't know if any interviewer has said that to you, but I felt the need to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, that that's kind of been my, you know, my Your post- mission. It's a mission. Yeah. 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 It, it's my mission. You know, after leaving the drifters, you know, I, I, I decided you know, I started looking at what was happening in the playing field. And of course, those who write the narrative are the ones who win, basically. That's the way history is. But I got began to start looking at what's, what was being publicized and put out there and it, it wasn't looking too good to me. So I, you know, I decided to do something about it. And of course, that was the advent of my company, the Drifter Legends uh, Clubhouse. Is that why you created the Drifters Legends Clubhouse, so that you could set the record straight? That's correct. It basically started out as a publishing, you know, operation. And so I just began to start writing. The interesting thing is, in my earlier years also, I used to do a little paralegal work, you see. And so I, I was very good at research and finding out, you know, different things. And so my attorney at that time, he used to send me around the uh, country. And I had all the, you know, the codes and things to get into the files. And so I had pulled up mounds and mounds of documents on the drifters from one side of the United States to the other. Uh, right now, I have a storage bin full of stuff. So it allows me to write books because I had so much data about each and every member in the group. And as you know, there's been over 65 or more members that have come through the Drifter lineups since 1953. Well, I have uh, an idea. Can I, do you mind if I share an idea with you? Sure. I think the story of the Drifters would make an amazing mini series. And I think you're the one to write the script. Thank you. Well, you know, funny enough, it's something that I, have been looking at because I am writing a lot of a lot of stuff. A miniseries hasn't been done. A film hasn't been done. You know, all these things haven't been done like they've done on a, n- a number of other groups. Well, um, the reason the pro- I'm suggesting a miniseries is because the story lends itself to more than just a two hour movie. I think it would, you know, there were there were three golden eras and there's a lot of information that would work well in let's say eight or 10 episodes. What do you think? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and that's uh, it's giving me more food for thought. You know. <laughs> well, you got to promise me, Butch, when you write that screenplay and it becomes number one on Netflix or Amazon Prime or one of those platforms, will you please come back and talk to me about it? Oh, most definitely. That would be my dream. Uh, well, you're <laughs> the one that. to do it. I really think you're the one to do it. You know, if you look at Dream Girls, which was loosely based on the Supremes, loosely, I think that something like a miniseries that really goes into what I said before, the exploitation, the the poor treatment, the misinformation, but also the incredible triumphant songs, the great, great music. There's such love for the drifters and their music. I think you have an audience there. All you've really got to do given that you have all the documentation, you know the history so, so well. I just think it's, and you're a great writer. It's a, this is a miniseries waiting to happen. And why shouldn't you be the one to benefit from it? Yes, uh, you're right. (laughs) I just got to get my butt up and (laughs) get busy. (laughs) Well, you are very busy. I mean, I look, you have a very popular podcast on the Clubhouse platform. And you don't just talk about the drifters. You've discussed the Afro-American dynamic in the geopolitical world and the history of the Black press and a number of other very deep subjects. Why did you decide to start the podcast? Well, one, because in this day and time, podcasts have become kind of prominent since 
pandemic period, you know, podcasting has gotten kind of popular. I noticed, you know, I was looking around and I said, well, you know, I could do that. I've always wanted to do to host or do something in that in that vein. And so I decided to uh, go down that down that road. And of course, you know, looking at the subjects that I I do know quite well, of course, is the drifters. And but the other side of it was I wanted to get into African and Afro-American history. You know, it's something that I've uh, studied and have been part of all my life. So I decided to sit down and start writing some notes and putting some things together. And then, of course, you know, there is a big book, which I will, you know, be releasing sometime in the first of the year. That's an area that I just wanted to get into, tell the story. I'm also working on an audio book series. It's just another avenue for me telling stories or telling my story or, or whatever. So I, it, that's a good uh, vehicle to travel down. You know, I'm slowly getting better at it. It's just, it's, it was still new to me, but, I, you know, I work on it every day, you know, you know, almost every day, just about I'm writing or recording something, whether it's uh, history or entertainment related, even political things, because I'm, I'm very interested in world affairs and all these things. And so I keep my ear to the ground on what's going on. You are what they call a Renaissance man. And I just hope that somewhere between the recording, the writing, the podcast, that you will have time to put together the definitive biopic, so to speak, the the mini series of the Drifters. I think it's a great idea. I really can visualize it. Uh, I wonder when you were way back, you know, right before you went to the Vietnam War, you're this shy kid. Did you ever think that you'd have the career in show business that you've had? Not really. You know, like I said, that just came out of (laughs) <laughs> almost like thin air <laughs> to a certain degree. What do you think would have happened if you had not been scooped up into a legendary music group? Where, what were you going to do? Well, that's interesting. I'm not sure what I would have, you know, actually been doing. Fate is, you know, has its, has its thing. You so know, you believe used... in destiny? Basically, I do. I look at all things are written. People pray for things. They do all these things. But it's all written. It's written in the, in the fabric of the universe in life itself. So who knows, you know, tomorrow, I'm not sure where I might be. But one thing I do do is that I keep reinventing myself. And, and you keep the legacy of the drifters alive. Oh, you yes. Know, you're really the only one. I want to tell our viewers that you can find out more about Butch Leak and the Drifters Legends Clubhouse by going to their website that is now showing on your screen. And on Facebook, you can go to the official Drifters Legends Clubhouse LLC page, as well as Butch Leak's own Facebook page. And don't forget to check out his podcast on the Clubhouse podcast radio platform. Well, Butch, it's been such an honor to meet you. You're part of music history. You're part of a legendary group. You've had quite the solo career yourself. Thank you so much for all the music you've brought to the world. Thank you for all the joy you've brought to us. I really look forward to following your next project, the new book, and hopefully the screenplay. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, thank you for having me. I was, you know, happy to meet you and I heard so much about you, you know, so I said, this should be exciting, you know. (laughs) Well, it was a great honor for me. Our our guest has been former member of the Drifters and CEO and star of the Drifters Legends Clubhouse, Butch Leak. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, and to my team in L.A. and to Steve Osborne, Darren Jay, and my entire team in the U.K. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.